All right, cool. It's about quarter till now. Um, thanks for coming. This is a front end ops session. Um, so we're going to be talking about a lot of cool stuff that you can do to automate your front end uh, workflow and also automate other pieces of front end development. Um, and really, uh, this is what I like to call uh, how to automate the process of breaking things. Um, because that's mostly what I did uh, in order to get to this point, to be able to share all this with you. Um, so, uh, uh, my name is Chris Rupel, um, one consonant short of our favorite content management framework. Uh, I'm a front-end developer at Four Kitchens in uh, Austin, Texas. Um, you can hit me on all these things. R-U-P-L is uh, my username everywhere that I can make it that. Um, and then, like I said, we're at Four Kitchens. We're a development shop in Austin. Maybe you've heard of us. Uh, if not, um, we have uh, done a lot of stuff around uh, server performance in the past, um, namely with uh, Pressflow, making Drupal 6 viable for like uh, integrating with the larger web stack, like um, uh, MySQL replication, Varnish, and that kind of stuff. Um, I have nothing to do with that, so don't ask me any questions about any of that, <laughs> because I don't know. Um, also, we're hiring, uh, so if you feel like working at a pretty awesome company um, with a lot of cool people, um, hit, the, hit the link in the slides here. Um, these slides are already posted on my session page, so you can go there and check it out via the schedule if you want and follow along. Um, if not, that's cool too. Uh, there's lots of code, ex code examples, and I'll get to that in a second. Um, so I've done a couple contributions to Drupal here. I don't have many of them listed just because I had to pick a few. Uh, the big one that I really focus on is the modernizer Drupal module. Um, that in turn led me to be able to make some small contributions to modernizer itself. Um, I've got a pretty cool Jekyll schedule thing that's out there like, oh, okay, sorry Jekyll, I shouldn't have mentioned that. Um, and then I've done some work on Drupal 8 uh, way back in the day when it was more like Drupal 7 than anything else. Um, also making it a little mobile friendly, and uh, although I've taken a hiatus, I um, am interested in all the Drupal 8 JavaScript stuff. If you were just in here for Nod's presentation before, um, there's some cool things that are happening. So um, that's me. Um, so this is in the DevOps track, and uh, it's, it's fairly simple compared to a lot of stuff that's going on because um, front end is, uh, although we're like starting to gain these tools in the front end world, um, none of this is like new. So, uh, you know, if you are already familiar with like a lot of DevOps and like you're uh, the person that handles all of that in your organization, then um, I'm probably not going to be like blowing your mind with the fact that you can automate some of these things. But uh, hopefully, I'll show you, be able to show you a few tools that you can leverage using a system that you've already got set up. Um, having said that, um, I'm not going to cover the specifics of like setting up Jenkins or anything like that because that's kind of like out of the scope of this. And this is there's other material where you can go and learn that type of thing. Um, so we're gonna talk about other things that we can integrate with uh, continuous integration and, and those types of systems. Um, but like I said, front end is uh, maturing as a trade and it really has matured a lot in the last few years. And so uh, we're starting to feel a lot of pain points that people already felt in other communities long ago. Um, so like, you know, when you break a PHP script, it just like gives you nothing or it gives you an xdebug stack or something like that. Um, and so you either get your HTML to the page or you don't. Um, and then, yes, there are other nuances involved in like errors in PHP, and you can have lots of weird things, but you know, if you really break something, um, you're either breaking it or it's not broken. Um, and then on the front end, because of the way that browsers evolved and the, because of the way that they have to support all these different scenarios, there's lots of weird, subtle things that can happen to your browser and to a mobile phone and to other devices like that that are very, very subtle and unnoticeable until they've become like this bigger problem. And so a lot of this stuff uh, are things that we just, you know, uh, rely on someone to like fix and then not break, but we never had any way of making sure that someone isn't doing that and error checking all of these things like CSS, you know, minor padding changes or margin changes. Changes to JS files that break things, like you know, just adding or removing a semicolon can delete an entire uh, aggregate's worth of usefulness. Um, aggregates changing when not necessary, and that kind of thing. Introducing like performance regressions when, uh, when you don't really need to be doing that. So 
Uh, and then also, like I said, uh, there's tools that are evolving too, and we need to use these tools because although it's not all about the tools, uh, tools can really help you to provide a better experience to users in a way because um, if they take out a lot of, autom uh, if they <laughs> provide automation and take a lot of tedium away from your work, then you're able to use uh, proper uh, testing protocols and that kind of stuff a little more thoroughly because you've got a tool doing this for you instead of having to like run this automatically. So like I said, there's workflow tools in PHP. There's more than I could possibly name. And so we need the same community of tools built around the front end trade because um, that's how it can be taken more, uh, it can be taken to the next level and be more effective. So there's lots of things now that you can do in front end that are just a few uh, commands away on your command line um, that were just not even existing two or three years ago. Things like dependency management, um, automated testing and review tools, and like even holding people accountable for the changes that they make to the code base. So um, this is not my term, um, and this is, this is a term that's been around. It's kind of been on the tip of everyone's tongue, and it's still like a spot that hasn't been explicitly filled in most organizations, or really, mo yeah, almost all. Um, uh, there's a guy, Alex Sexton, that wrote an article for Smashing Magazine um, describing the ideal front-end ops engineer. And so he goes through the whole spiel of what he considers to be front-end operations. And there's a lot there. Um, if you go read this article, it is linked in these slides. Um, it's kind of buried in the, in the green there. But um, you can go read it, and he talks about uh, everything from you know, deployment and asset management to making sure that rendering times are staying the same in your browser stack and all of that kind of stuff. So there's a lot, lot, lot there. However, we are at a Drupal conference and most people, for the most part, are just building websites instead of building like a product or a huge like complex application. And so all the examples I'm gonna show you today are kind of like starter examples that should get you thinking about this kind of stuff and you can apply it and just build on this and um, keep it going because uh, these are useful for basically all websites that are being built. Um, and uh, it can be taken to so many degrees past what I'm gonna show you that uh, it, would, it, it blows my mind when I see what's going on in the front end world. So the main takeaway today is that we wanna change how we work. Um, we don't wanna change like and, and be married to a particular tool. This stuff, you know, changes really fast, but what we do want to do is change how we're working. Um, was there a question back there? Or, okay, sorry. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm a fan of just like stopping. If anyone wants to stop me and ask a question at the end of a section, I'll try and put some space in there so we don't have to wait till the end. Um, so feel free if you want to just come up to one of those mics. So in order to deliver the best, fastest site possible, we do have to you know, think about our, our development process and, and update it a little. Uh, the, my, uh, my huge perf crush right now is uh, Ilya Grigoric of Google. Um, he's on the Make the Web Fast team, at uh, the part of the Chrome team, basically. And um, all he does is performance. And he's basically always saying, you know, this isn't like a checklist that you look at at the end of your project. This is something that has to be continuous as you develop. Um, this, you cannot put it at the end and expect to be successful. And, and then uh, Fiert, which I'm not even going to try and pronounce his real name, uh, uh, has a great quote here that says, uh, when you're trying to uh, fix a website or make it better, don't take measures without measuring them. Uh, that's a bit of an English wordplay, but still, uh, don't um, do something without testing what you're doing. Don't like radically train, change a strategy that you're approaching to, you know, like, We've got a lot of things figured out in Drupal, like aggregation, for example. But you know, if you're going to change something or like change the way you're loading your assets, make sure you've got good data that says that this is useful for your target audience. So, a lot of these things are going to help you do that. Yes, right. We all agree, <laughs> because this question always comes up very often. Yes, all this stuff is on GitHub already. The links are on the session page. Check it out. You can take the code from the slides. It's all freely available. Use it for commercial purposes or whatever. I don't care. Uh, and also, um, actually, this is a slight lie because I was like, I don't want to get caught by the Wi-Fi gremlins. Um, but I basically, about 15 minutes ago, uh, took a fresh clone of these slides, 
and basically installed all the NPM modules that I'm going to show you. So I'm not going to run the NPM installs, but uh, the slide should work out of the box. Um, and also, uh, one of the Ruby examples, you might need an RVM version or something like that, but still, they should be pretty close to working out of the box so that you can inspect them. Um, so cool. Uh, automating workflow. This is the first thing that we'll talk about here. Um, I'm just going to go over a couple tools that uh, help us stop doing manual labor. And like I said, when you stop doing manual labor, you can uh, more frequently um, focus on delivering your work and ha letting the testing tools just kind of uh, do that for themselves. So automation helps us stay consistent and it helps us uh, deliver a quality product. Um, Grunt, has everyone heard of Grunt? Let's get a show of hands. Okay, yeah, that's decent, cool. So Grunt is, uh, bills itself as a JavaScript task runner. And what that means is that it does a bunch of grunt work for you. It does all these tedious things that you don't want to do. Um, and it does this in an automated fashion. So you can read more about GruntJS, but basically it's a set of tools that you run on your computer, on your dev environment, and it allows you, it, it basically does things for you that you wouldn't want to do on your own. And um, then everyone's happy because the, both the things are getting done and we're not doing them. Hooray! The basics of Grunt, uh, Grunt is basically, it's got a core and then it's got contrib modules, just like Drupal. So uh, what you're going to do is, it's all based on NPM, which is a Node's package manager, NPM. Uh, and so if you're not familiar with Node.js, you don't really have to be to run all this stuff. You're going to see the code examples and see how little we're actually interacting with Node once you install it. Um, and basically we're just going to run a couple commands and then you're done. Um, they do have uh, excellent intro instructions if you want to be familiar with Grunt, and the slides contain the examples. Um, another tool, I'm just going to go through a summary of all the tools and then we're going to move on and look at them. PhantomJS. Phantom is a headless instance of WebKit, and what that means is that um, it, it's exactly like the web browser that you're using, I guess Safari, <laughs> uh, not Chrome anymore, uh, but they're close enough that it's still useful. Um, and so it does anything a WebKit browser can do, except there's no monitor. It's all just happening inside the computer. It can, however, produce um, visual like screenshots and that kind of stuff, which I'm going to specifically demo in a little bit. So this thing is really cool, and it gives you a console, and you can like run jQuery and evaluate DOM nodes and do all sorts of stuff. And Fandom is its own tool, which I'm going to show you extremely specific applications of. But you can do tons of stuff in Fandom. Uh, tons, tons more than I'm going to show today, and it's a super awesome tool. Um, so, yep, like I said, it's indispensable, and you, uh, if you have a task like taking a screenshot at like a several different breakpoints or something like that, you find yourself needing to do that mm -hmm. to get like sign off on a bunch of work, then like Phantom is the tool for you. So check that one out. Docs, API, blah, blah, blah. Slimer, I don't really know. Um, I guess Slimer, like Ghostbusters or something, um, is the uh, not yet headless instance of Gecko, which is the engine that runs Firefox. Um, and I hope, I'm not positive, but uh, that it's going to apply to Firefox OS as well, which would be huge. Um, Slimer.js is newer than Phantom, so it doesn't have all the bells and whistles, but they aim to be like API compatible, so that you can take like one script and say, Phantom, do this, Slimer, do this and you can do them both at the same time, which would be rad. So there's docs here, and like I said, it actually requires like Firefox to like do stuff. It's not headless yet. So on to some actual uh, automation here, right? Who here authors CSS and JS, right? Yeah, oh, only three of you. Okay, interesting. <laughs> um, that's surprising, so um, do we have like an entire group of IT here, or what's going on? Are you guys just lazy, maybe? I don't know. Uh, so the meat and potatoes of front end is CSS and JS. I hope a few front end people are here to take a, to kind of start imagining this stuff. Um, if you were in the last session about uh, Drupal 8 JavaScript, you may have heard Theodore mention um, JS Hint. And so what they did was they went through the code base and they made sure that all the JavaScript in Drupal 8 um, could adhere to strict JS Hint uh, linting, is what it's called. And um, so basically, if you look at JS Hint, let's um, see if I can 
Yeah. Yeah, there we go. So JS Hint is a code uh, quality tool. And what you do is you put a bunch of JavaScript in here and you just type and then, you know, it tells you what's wrong with your JavaScript. We're not going to do that now. But it can basically help you debug and uh, JS and help you catch little mistakes that you might make. So, you know, sometimes you can, like, forget a semicolon and then it affects something that's like 30 lines down the document when the parser finally catches up with it, right? And so that's really hard to find, but JS Hint makes this easy. And it does other things like tell you, hey, you're not using this variable, or you know, you haven't um, used the uh, triple equals, which is like it avoids coercing variables, and it's more of a strict conditional to check. Um, so it does all this cool stuff. Uh, actually, you know what? Um, I can show you here some checkboxes at the bottom. So this is a good example. So it does it does all of these things um, just for the video later too, um, including like strict or even uh, loose checking of, of ECMAScript. So you can go, it defaults to five, um, and you can go up to six or down to three. Um, and going down to three is useful if you've got um, IE678 implementations that you want to uh, work with. And then there's all this other stuff too. So, whoa, no. Um, so, uh, uh, like I said, this is a useful tool, but sometimes it's tedious to go and like put the JavaScript in there every time. So let's uh, automate this thing. Um, uh, so I'm going to jump over to the console here and going to skip the in install, like I said. But basically, uh, we're going to run grunt watch on uh, this particular example. So now I'm in the JS hint directory, and I'm just going to type grunt. And now grunt says it's running a watch task. Now, what does that mean? It says that it's, uh, for this particular task, I used a module in grunt called um, grunt watch which what it does is it watches the directory that you're developing in, or like a theme folder that you're developing in, and it basically does stuff when um, you change the code. So I've got the code over here, and you can see at the top, this file does have syntax errors that will trigger feedback from JS Hint. So I'm going to save this file, and you can see on the left that um, it instantly gives me a bunch of errors here. So it spit out a bunch of uh, JS Hint uh, output to me, that I can now read and grok. And it's saying, for starters, that I'm missing a semicolon at the end of this line. And it also says on line seven that I didn't do triple equals. And we'll just do this again and see how Grunt likes it. All right, I'd scrolled down, but normally it, you can see it when you, um, uh, so now you can see it says example JS changed again. And it's running uh, this stuff again. And this time, it says that I've got an extra comma here at the end of value 2 on, uh, on line 13. And uh, what that means is that um, I actually run, I ran this with uh, ES3 true right here. And so that option that I just showed you on JS hint, I have enabled for the grunt file. And this is just the configuration for the grunt task. Um, and what this means is that it's actually checking this and producing errors that IE 6, 7, and 8 would produce also. So I can do two things here. I can either change this to false, or I can take the comma at, away from uh, value uh, 2 here. And I will just change this to false real fast just to show you um, that there's only one error now. And it's actually watching the grunt file itself. So when I change the grunt file configuration, it automatically uh, fixes uh, some of the other stuff here. So. Um, we're missing a semicolon is the last thing. And I don't even know where that is. But it's OK, because it tells me. There we go. And see, it even highlights the little red thing for me. So, Oh, great. File example JS changed. We're running it. Two files are lint free, and it's done without errors. So you know that you've produced quality code now. And you can move on and be assured that the code doesn't have any errors that you didn't catch because JS Hint has told you, hey, you're good to go, which is pretty awesome. How many people have had problems with JavaScript and like this alone would be like something awesome that would help your day? Thank you. Yeah, <laughs> me too. So this is, this is great stuff um, if you write a lot of JavaScript. Um, so cool. That's JS Hint. Any questions about JS Hint? The performance with large files, that's a good question. There's not really a problem. This is all local development too, 
And um, I've had installs that have like dozens and dozens of files that you know I either wrote or vendor files. And you can also um, in the configuration here, um, if you do have lots of files, so like I accidentally set this up incorrectly before, and um, and I had like it was actually checking node modules, the fo folder node modules, um, which is bad. <laughs> Because node modules, you know, like when you in npm install stuff, it'll go grab like, you know, 20, 30 packages or something like that. And then they all had like these strict validation errors. So um, this configuration file is just checking top level JS files. And if I switch this to something like star star slash star dot JS, now it'll check all those node modules that here I can show you. Oh, no, I turned the, uh, I turned the ES stuff off. Oh, my task is dead. Oh, that's funny. Well, anyway, the point is that you can uh, specify different directories and that kind of thing. So if you only want to hit uh, one directory, that's totally possible. So everything is in that grunt file too. And you can see that the watch task that I wrote, very, very simple. The watch just checks a bunch of files and then says run it on JS hint. In fact, that's probably where this needs to go, but I'm not going to hack on this in the middle of a presentation. Um, so that, that's the kind of thing um, to watch out for. That's a really good question, so thank you for bringing it up. You shouldn't have any problems with this, and if you do, you just kind of skip the pieces that you don't have any control over, upstream packages and the like. Um, oh, and then also this force uh, flag can allow you to, uh, uh, by default, it'll just like stop when it finds errors, and it's like, fix this before I'll even can think about going on, and you can make it generate everything for you so that you can you know, do them in really big passes. And then, as we just saw, you can save your files like normal, and you're hinting. Um, there are tons and tons of examples of Grunt Watch, and um, earlier this year, we uh, went uh, full in on it and for our Drupal Camp Austin site. And so we've got a great Grunt file with a bunch of docs, and um, also in the back there is uh, Ian, who is the mastermind behind all this. So. I may just like punt it to him if, uh, if anybody's got like really advanced questions about Grunt Watch, but um, the Grunt file has all of these built into it. So JS hint, uglify, which minifies your JavaScript. Then you can concatenate things into different builds. Um, you can minify your images. You can run compass. You can run live reload. You can run Jekyll. And you can even have flags that do dev and prod build modes for this kind of stuff, which is pretty awesome. So if you want to build your JavaScript differently when you're developing or not minify it when you're developing and then minify it in your production, um, you can have all this stuff running through Grunt, no problemo. Any more questions about Grunt Watch, Grunt in general? Cool. So performance testing. Um, this is a hot topic because, like I said, if you want to build a fast site, you got to start out by building a fast site instead of just trying to tack it on at the end. Um, that will not work as well as we all want it to, even though it would be great if it did. So everyone's familiar with YSlow, right? Everyone's used YSlow. We've all used YSlow. That's awesome. So YSlow is that service that grades front-end performance for you. Um, and then there are many best practices that are checked here, and you get a grade. So it delivers A through F. Um, I don't know if that's a common grading system, but it is common to US pupils. Uh, historically, uh, you had to go to each web page that you wanted to test in YSlow, but that is boring and tedious. So you can capture uh, the data that you need to perform analysis via YSlow very easily um, using Phantom. So uh, Phantom uh, pro comes with a netsniff.js or netsniff.coffee, if that's your thing, um, to allow you to uh, generate HAR files. Uh, HAR, I don't even remember what it stands for, but it's basically when you look at a network waterfall that um, is not going to show up here, but this network tab basically is uh, what you're uh, looking at when the HAR is a JSON file that this is uh, visualizing. And so you can uh, install the YSlow node module and basically get um, a readout of this thing. So I'm going to take this example here. Oh, no, I'm not. This is what you get for, there we go. I think that's the end of it. Perfect. Oh, man, that's some 
wacky reveal stuff happening. But So I'm going to run this command, and it's a little big, but I'll talk about each piece here before we do it. Oh, actually, here. It's at the top now. Uh, at the beginning, cutoff here is phantom, JS. That's all it says. And then we're going to, actually, this isn't going to work in this directory, so hold on. Um, Okay, cool. So now I'm going to run phantom.js in the examples folder of phantom, and it's going to use the net sniff, and it's going to look up fourkitchens.com, which is my employer's website. And then the pipe means that it's going to pipe it to YSlow, and then I've told it to grade me and give it in a plain format so it's going to look pretty in the console. All right, so I'm going to hit enter. There's a delay because what it's doing is it's requesting the website, and it's pulling down this JSON, and then it's grading everything, and it's running this node module on, this, on the thing here. Um, so actually, this is like too much information uh, for the screen, but here's the basic stuff here uh, and broken out. You can see, oh, we're not using a CDN, so we got an F. Um, but, and this is a terrible conference Wi-Fi, and, um, well, actually, it's not that terrible. I take that back, conference, since, since this is being recorded. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so it, it's actually being pretty good, but... It's not, the, it's not the number I want to see when I'm like checking this stuff, which is a footnote that I'll get to in a second. Um, you can see here that it says that our website is 512K. Hooray! And the overall score is a B, which is really uh, not that bad. B is for not that bad. And um, uh, then the URL, the number of requests that we incurred when we were doing this, uh, the rule set, and then like the number of milliseconds that it took for the page to load. Now, off the top of my head, I don't know if this is the content DOM loaded event or the uh, or DOM content loaded, and or the uh, page onload, which is, comes much later in the stack, uh, especially if you're doing things right. Um, but basically, you can get this basic information, and um, if you hook this up to Jenkins and you like push a branch to GitHub, and then the YSLO comes back and emails you and says like, "Hey, by the way, you added 1,200 milliseconds to your page load time." You know that you're not done working because you need to unbreak whatever you broke while you were working. Unless, of course, your goal was to add a carousel to your homepage, and then you've done what you meant to do. <laughs> so that's uh, YSLO in a nutshell. Um, and then also, there are other uh, versions of this. Um, you can do YSLO for Phantom. Um, and this is a, the exact same command in a different syntax. Actually, it's not the exact same command because it says example.com. But you do need to watch out for uh, these tools because due to the way they're built, you can find significant differences between the tools. And so like one test is never good enough. Um, like to get a good margin of error, sometimes I'll run like 10 of them just to see what the average is for all of them. And I don't have a way of like scripting all that together, but you can at least look and see like, is there a problem with our Wi-Fi right now or something like that? Um, a lot of these tools aren't gonna be hand handy for local development. You wanna do this on some sort of staging QA server, right? so that you're using the real internet with latency involved and all of that kind of stuff. So does anybody have any questions about YSLO? Cool, total experts, I like this. All right, what's up? The question was, I put the URL, the, the particular URL, is it gonna scan the whole website or just one page? And the answer is one page. It'll just scan the URL that you provide. So if you wanted to do this multiple times, you'd have to set up the command multiple times and do it for slash about, slash team, you know, slash subscriptions or whatever. Um, but if you've put this into a script, it's, it's really not that bad. And this in particular is very low power. Like it's not gonna pound your server to, to do this. And if you had like 10 URLs you wanted to check, no problem. It does it in a, just a second. Another question? Alan? Is there an equivalent for uh, Google page speed? Automating page speed. <laughs> <laughs> I should read your slide more. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. That was totally unplanned, by the way. <laughs> so not to be outdone by Yahoo, Google has a competing service called PageSpeed Insights. Um, depending on how you feel about Google and Yahoo and all that, um, you might find this one to be more interesting, right? Uh, so it can also be automated by getting an API key. Um, uh, and then you can also sign up for their service, which right now is free, but you have to sign up for a waiting list. And they say that this is going to become a paid service. So um, 
using the API may uh, suit you better if you don't want to incur a subscription cost later on at some unplanned date. But they are being forthcoming about saying that yes, this is going to turn into a paid service once we've hammered out all the kinks and we feel really good about offering it. Um, so yes, uh, Google can do the exact same thing. Um, they don't use the letter grading system. Um, they just use a bunch of numbers and they score it uh, out of 100, I think, each, each way or each facet. So uh, the PageSpeed API is documented quite thoroughly, but there's also a grunt plugin for this. Um, so if you were developing on a remote server, um, you can have this set up to run when you, uh, like, for, for example, like I use Sublime, so I have to have the files locally, and then like when I want to show something on a remote server, I have to FTP it up automatically, right? Well, you could like put a delay in there and then have your computer do the page speed lookup or the YSL lookup on your remote server as you're developing, so everything stays in sync. Um, but Grunt's page speed is basically the same thing here. Um, we're going to back out of that one, go to page speed. So we're in examples, grunt page speed in the repo uh, that's on the DrupalCon site. And so I've already done npm install, but I'm just going to run grunt. And this is set up to grade fourkitchens.com once again. And so it's running the task. And unlike watch, this is a discrete command that you have to run at a, at a moment's notice. Now, you could set it up with grunt watch. That's totally doable. But as I have it here, it's just a command that I run you can see that my shell is returned at the bottom of the screen, and we're back um, at the prompt. You see, you can see this is a shell because I actually have a shell. I'm so proud of my emoji. Um, so here's the, uh, the results of the page speed desktop task. Now, you're probably thinking in your head, Chris, don't you, aren't you a proponent of not using those types of words? Well, in this case, I have to because page speed has two modes, desktop and mobile. So, that's their decision, not mine. And so uh, the Grunt plugin uh, basically can do both of them, and it's just a matter of configuring it. And I can show the Grunt file in a second if anyone's interested, or afterwards if not too many people are interested. Um, so basically it said, here's your URL. Your score is 84, You're grading us a little harder. Um, you can see the green on the side, because I set a threshold of 80. Um, so, fourkitchens.com, it says US strategy is desktop and the threshold, the score that we're looking for is 80. Um, you can see here that mobile is set up exactly the same with the same threshold, but the strategy is mobile. Hooray. So, excuse me. Um, it shows the number of resources, the number of hosts that are pulling this stuff. Um, see, it complained about CDNs earlier, but we are kind of using a CDN. Um, the uh, total request in bytes and all this sort of response time stuff. And you can look at these and make sure that your numbers aren't changing or going up too far and all of that kind of stuff. Uh, the number of files that you're loading and so forth. And so this is great. Then it tells you a bunch of other more advanced stuff that is when I start tugging on the shoulder of someone at my job and say like, ah, how do we do gzip compression? Um, so you want to avoid redirecting and it'll tell you how many times you've redirected because if you're using m dots or anything like that, um, rethink that, and um, you know, leveraging browser caching and all these advanced features, right? So uh, these are numbers that you can get out of the PageSpeed plugin. And then what I'm going to do here is I'm going to run PageSpeed colon mobile, which is, uh, if you saw up here, running PageSpeed colon desktop, that's the, um, what's called the default task in Grunt. And so it does page speed here, and then since desktop is the first thing inside page speed, it just picks desktop. If I were to move these, it would load mobile um, instead of desktop when I just ran grunt. So now, um, whoops, there we go. Grunt page speed mobile. It's doing the exact same thing, although it's simulating a mobile phone this time. And look at that, it's red. So because the threshold is still 80, and I got an overall score of 69, you can see that um, it's saying that, hey, you've kind of fallen below your absolute threshold. So you could have this thing basically alert you whenever you fall below a particular threshold, rather than having to check it manually every time. And same numbers are here, it's just done in a different way, 
and it has like a little stricter requirements for this type of stuff because it knows that mobile phones have smaller cache files and that kind of thing. So uh, that's all good, right? Um, and and uh, that's basically PageSpeed uh, in a nutshell. Any questions about PageSpeed? Nah, cool. Um, this one is also really awesome, CSS regression testing. So like I said in the beginning, you can uh, nudge CSS around really easily because CSS has no scope. And so, you know, sometimes you're just like, whoa, someone messed up the CSS, that's impossible. Um, so CSS can be knocked out of place really easily and we need to prevent this. So enter Wraith. Um, Wraith is a tool from BBC News and it's open source and what it allows you to do is leverage Phantom or Slimer, your choice, to take screenshots of two different environments, producing a visual diff of those two screenshots. Holy cow. All right, so we've got an example here of BBC News, and you can see all this blue on the page is stuff that changed just a little. And so someone like nudged it out of place or maybe increased the font size a little, and it starts to just go haywire, basically. And this is a super cool thing. And then also there's that little blue circle at the top, I think, Someone like added an icon or something. Like, does this work? Oh yeah, there we go. Um, so that's Wraith. Let's uh, do a really quick Wraith uh, check here. So I'm going to install it, and then we're going to run the default that comes with Rake. Um, so, and yeah, it's all there. <laughs> so we're going to run Rake which is, this is a Ruby tool, and so this is the command that runs the tool that we're using. So what it's doing is it's looking up, um, I believe, like BBC Russian and BBC uh, UK, and it's uh, checking the slash path, so it's checking home. And I guess I'll talk a little slower because sometimes this takes a while. <laughs> um, and you can see it says it's doing width 320, and now it's gonna do 600, 720, 1024, a couple different options here. And it's literally loading up the web page, resizing the window, taking a full screenshot of it, saving it to disk, and then doing the other domain as well. And it's setting all of those together and it's putting them aside. And then after it takes all the screenshots, what it's gonna do is it's gonna run a diff, just like a code diff, or, um, but it's a diff on the images themselves. Um, and it's gonna show us those changes that were introduced uh, between the two domains. Um, this one can actually run uh, 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 behind HTX or no HT, T, HTTP auth. So if you have like a really informal user pass on your dev environments and it you know prompts you to enter the user pass before you hit your dev environment, you can actually include that by just saying like HTTP colon slash slash user colon name at my dev domain dot whatever. Um, oh, now it's doing another one. Hooray. I should have made the config file shorter. But basically, it's running through all these configs that are sitting there. Um, and then um, at the end, it's going to give us a web page, a nicely formatted web page. Like, we're getting a little too much for our money here, <laughs> which is none. Um, so whenever someone comes into a queue and it's kind of cranky at me, I learned from, uh, I believe I heard this from Greggles originally, but just tell them, hey, you're getting what you paid for. But in this case, we really are, so. <laughs> uh, we're almost done here. We got two more 1280s to go. And then we're gonna see the results, which are awesome. Does anybody have any questions about this while it's finishing up? Is it just a visual output, or do you get some sort of mathematical, you know, 99% difference, maybe 2% difference? Right now, as the tool works, uh, it it just gives you visual output and it crops them and puts thumbnails on this gallery page. But um, I haven't dug into the code deeply, but I feel like you could probably produce those numbers um, if you altered the tool or something like that. So saving diffs here, it's almost done. Any other questions? All right, here we go. Um, Shots, gallery. All right, so here's the difference. This is actually huge. It's a lot bigger than it was last time. But you get the point, so we just did this dynamically. And you can see that because I've got this huge cookie prompt at the top, it makes it kind of useless. But 
Um, you can run this. I think it would be possible to run it with Node.js and stuff like that. No JavaScript is what I mean. Um, but you can see that it labels them all with resolutions, and then it moves on to the UK index page here. And so you can set up many different config files, and these are actually pretty simple. So um, if I show the Wraith configs, and um, actually, as I was messing with this, I found that it had a config bug, which they've actually fixed now. So you can run multiple configs, or you can say rake, config, whatever, and just run one of them. Um, so basically, it'll put it in the shots here. You put your domains right here. Um, you t tell your screen widths what you want, and then paths also. So very simple syntax, and it does the rest for you. Very, very simple. Here, so the uh, people in the back. Theoretically, is this something you tend to use for, say, comparing a local environment to a stage, that kind of thing? Yeah, so the first time I used this, it was incredibly useful because um, we were on a crunch, and so like for two or three weeks, I was just like, oh, IE8, I'm not going to test it. And it was a responsive site, and I did a bunch of bad things, right? And so then what came, came time to, to actually fixing that, and so I was like, okay, let's fix the IE8 problems. I made sure that I was fixing them, but what I did at the same time was that I ran Wraith after I was done, and I produced a zero-byte diff on all of my WebKit screenshots to confirm that I had not created any regressions while I was doing the IE fixes. So the IE fixes had to be done manually in browser scope and VMs and stuff like that. But yes, you can basically um, confirm. A lot of times what you're confirming is that you're not changing anything. So Alan, to answer your question a second ago, um, it does tell you the numbers here in bytes, but there's no percentage. But you can actually like grep through this page that it generates and find that you, if it, if it says anything other than zero bytes, then you know, you got a little work to do. So you can automate that even further, I suppose, although I don't have it set up right now. But that is something you could also do with Phantom because you could look this web page up locally on your hard drive, load it with Phantom, look for these zero byte strings, uh, the, the actual string of zero bytes and that kind of thing. Does that answer your question mostly? Oh, yeah. Cool, awesome. Yeah? What is the possible significance for QA in the sense of getting uh, material from the designer like data and, and comparing that to the uh, HTML generated by the system? That's an interesting question. The question was, could you use this for design QA, getting um, screenshots from a PSD, I assume, or something like that, and then comparing your uh, web output to a static like image that was generated before. Um, I, don't know, I don't know if that would be easy to do immediately, but you could run through the diff code, and I'll bet that that could be a possibility. Um, so yes, it's technically possible, but it's not a feature of this tool right at the moment out of the box. But that's a very interesting point. Put the JPEG of the URL. Well, okay, so yeah, that's also a good point. You could put a JPEG of your site up on the website somewhere and then do that type of a diff. So yeah, that'd be an easy kind of like workaround for um, not changing the tool, but just getting a URL out of the thing. Yeah. Um, and then also, they're working on doing Slimer versus Phantom comparisons. So you load up the same URL, the same path, you're not changing any of those. So you're not changing dev environments, but what you're changing is the engine, which is rendering the web page. So you can see differences between Slimer and Gecko, or, sorry, Phantom and Slimer, which are WebKit and Gecko. You can kind of see the differences between those two. I personally am not too worried about that type of thing because it is the web and you've got to like embrace the squishiness and the, the diversity of everything, but um, still it's something that you want to know sometimes. So you yeah. might want to compare the two engines. Any other questions? IE can't do this. You just need a more modern stack that, like, so the, part of the reason is because it's not open source. So both Phantom and Slimer are only possible because the engines themselves are open source and you can fork them and do with them what you want. Um, and so that's, uh, that's just how it is. Um, but basically, uh, Wraith uh, can do all this stuff and if there were ever an IE engine that were produced, that like a tool that were to produce this way, I'm sure someone would immediately add it to the stack because it would be certainly useful. Um, we already talked about this, but this is the syntax for multiple configs. Um, so yeah, I said at the beginning I wouldn't talk about Jenkins at all really. 
and I'm not going to show you how to do this, but I, we do have a blog post up here that illustrates the general concepts needed to uh, automate all this stuff. So basically what you're doing is you're combining Git hooks and some sort of CI server of your choice. So I'm not at all opinionated about what you should or shouldn't use, um, but you basically need those two ingredients, a way to trigger things via version control or disk IO, and then a way to do something with that trigger. So we use Jenkins and GitHub webhooks. They're really easy, and we have um, a uh, blog post here that uh, outlines specifically how you build a Jenkins job so that when you push to master, it updates your trunk. And while this is a fairly um, mundane process in terms of CI, um, it does have all the ingredients necessary to get you up and running with like your first Jenkins job. So um, I included this just so you'd have somewhere to start if you weren't as familiar with Jenkins, and then you can go from there and basically read on your own. But um, I'm by no means even an expert of, at that, so whenever I do Jenkins stuff, I have a lot of help from my um, colleagues and all of that kind of stuff. But basically, you push to a repo, it sends a message to your CI server and says, hey, I've got some new stuff. And the CI server says, cool, I'm going to do something with the new stuff, and you're done. So in general, we have any general questions? How, am I good on time? Yeah. Okay, cool. Oh, gotcha. All right, because this is the DevOps track, I'm going to read you some information. <laughs> Drupal.org infrastructure team responsible for all infrastructure for the Drupal project, including Drupal.org and all the subsites, is looking for help. They have too many tasks to deal with and are looking to bring new people on to the team. They have a community conversation this Thursday, 1 p.m., 13, in uh, room 225. If you're interested, come and see how you can help. And the URL that I am going to show you is... Lee... Whoops. Oh, man, now I've done it. Infra team. I think I did that right. Yeah. Uh-huh. So the, um, if anyone's interested in helping out uh, Drupal.org. Sorry? Command option L. Press command option L to make it large. If you need it. Thanks, Sam. You're welcome. Thank you. I, I don't understand. Are you talking about the large URL underneath it? <laughs> okay, cool, man. So, does anybody have any other questions or suggestions? Uh, no? Oh, really? That means I did terrible if no one has questions. That's, that makes me feel bad. Are you, integrating, whoa, whoa, whoa. Whoa. <laughs> Are you integrating any sort of commercial services as opposed to these open source tools? So, Sauce Labs or any other um, things like that? Page speed would be the one thing that's potentially commercial um, that m you might rely on. But like I said, the Grunt plugin just re uses the API, and you sign up for a free key. It took me two minutes to log into Google and like turn the key on, generate it. Um, I kind of skipped this part, but the Grunt file actually has uh, um, a key thing here, which I just basically said, uh, read the file out of my file system, and so I don't have to like check in my key into the open source repo that I'm hosting. And basically, um, then you have 25,000 requests a day. But if there were other commercial services that were worth it, I would. And one that comes to mind is Browser Stack. They have automated Selenium testing or something like that. So if you do want to do some of this stuff with IE, Browser Stack might be the option. Now, uh, oftentimes, like I haven't had the real need to do like serious like you know weeks worth of IE testing um, in order to like get something right but if I did have to do that I might take a couple days and like go and figure out Selenium on browser stack it's browserstack.com um, and it's a cool service if you've never used it for QA and stuff uh, we had a question uh, oh he's going to the mic awesome can you mix the uh all the, these things uh, between scripts in, in the stuff and Phantom and test with uh, Scasper GAs or something like that. You can mix all the, all this. Uh, yeah, you could totally mix all of these. So another one that was mentioned just now is, is Casper. And Casper is like an API on top of Phantom because Casper is another Phantom. And uh, 
So um, all of these all of these tools are built on each other. There's another one called Phantom CSS, which I was initially interested in, but um, Wraith uh, gets get you gets you what you want with um, slightly less trouble in my experience. Although I have had someone tell me that I was crazy because they found it dead simple to set up Phantom CSS. So I'm not actually making a claim here, but I'm just saying in my experience, I found one easy and one hard. I picked one based on that basically. Um, but yeah, by all means, mix these uh, together. Phantom uses require natively now, require.js. And so what that means is that you can load other modules, other JavaScript modules, which I'm talking about AMD modules in that case. We overuse the word module, I think, in front end now. Um, but basically you can add in other libraries and uh, uh, integrate them and mash them up and do all that kind of stuff. Yeah, totally possible. Mm -hmm. Did I see one more hand back there on the other side? Nope. Ah, web page test. What do I think about web page test? Um, in like the last talk I gave in Munich last year, um, I advertise it. It's it's good. I think it's a great service. Web page test is good in that you can get har files, you can get waterfalls out of uh, the data, and also it lets you uh, truly test geographic locations, which is fantastic. So you can say, I want an iPhone 3G from Syria or something like that. You know, you can just like pick a location. Or I want to test uh, some sort of like Nexus device from actual Korea, you know. And so you can do all these tests and, and uh, throttle your bandwidth. And web page tests is, is a really great tool. Um, I'm not up on the level of automation that's possible with those, but it is a great tool to look into. Um, and then actually you could just scan my GitHub, which was a link at the beginning of this presentation. And there's some slides uh, called front end per for high performance theming or something like that that have a bunch of information about both web page tests and blaze.io, which was the mobile version that Akamai acquired. So, um, whoops. So any other questions? Cool. Um, one last thing here. I think this is the right URL. No, it's not. There, that's the right URL. So here we can we can do the big Thing again. So if you could please uh, help me and the Drupal Association out by rating this session. Um, it helps me make better presentations and I want to hear like when I was too boring, when I was inaccurate about something, when I offended you, uh, all of that kind of thing. Actually, I definitely when I offended you. So um, if you could just go to this URL, it's j.mp slash dcp dash F-O-P-S. Um, uh, it's really easy to rate the sessions on Drupal.org and that'll take you straight to the page if you're logged in. And um, other than that, uh, thank you for coming and I hope you enjoyed it.